Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I broke up. Sorry. Can you hear me well? Yes. My screen just free. So <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for this very kind invitation to this webinar. I followed it last year and also the last couple of times. It's really amazing. Nice set of speakers and everything. So thank you for the invitation. Um, today, I want to, the title of my talk is Gold Nano Not Splitting with Light. Maybe before we start, I just want to give a very brief overview of what we do in my group. So we're interested Basically, we work at the interface of solid state physics and biophysics, where we do a lot of research on lipid membranes and, and cell membranes and how to interface them with plasmonic particles to study cells, optical tweezers and forces and plasmonic heating as well. So with my talk today, I actually will be more on the solid state physics side and talk about optical forces and heating because uh, I wanna talk about our recent research results where well, we reported the single step plasmonic dimer printing with gold by gold nanorod splitting with light. So what do I mean by that? Um, we heard already many talks in the, in the, over the course of the webinar about optical forces and printing of, of plasmonic particles. But what I wanna talk about today is the possibility to come from a position where you have a particle that you can use optical force to print or deposit on the surface, but to also manipulate the particle or reshape it in a very controlled way. Uh, and what I'm going to show today is that you can bend them uh, with, uh, with a controlled bending angle, but eventually also you can split a particle in a, in a laser trap and, and thereby create a plasmodic couple dimer in like a single step. And um, the process is involved in that. And I think um, what, what I'm trying to also um, advertise here is a, a little bit the idea that you can use forces and plasmonic heating uh, to, to maybe get new particle shapes and structures that are otherwise not accessible and to understand these processes to, to you know, uh, get new combinations or, or new strategies for, for particle formation. So <clears throat> the first part, of course, is the optical force that you can uh, exert on a particle. So we heard about this already uh, last week by the great lecture by Zhu Ming Cheng. Uh, where you talked about optical trapping and with nanorods, and I want to focus here on nanorods in my talk. Uh, first, uh, experiments have been performed in trapping on alignment of gold nanorods. Here's an example by Silhu et al. in the Udashede lab, where they reported in 2008 that you can trap a nanorod with a focused laser beam, and the nanorods were basically aligned with the polarization uh, of light because with the longitudinal axis, they will align because this is the highest uh, polarizability. And you can then go ahead and, and, and use that uh, approach to uh, not only align them in a laser trap, but you can also print them and you can print them with a preferred orientation. Uh, so this is shown here by the paper of Jack Wando at Al Nano Letters in 2013, where they use two lasers to actually orient a nanorod in a laser trap and then position it in a defined way on a, on a nano substrate, on a, on a glass substrate. But all these nanoparticles are aligned here. You can see this probably also on the glass slide, on this SCM image of the glass slide here. And of course, it's not only the two examples that I've shown here, but there are others by Pelton and Tong, and they're excellent reviews on this topic, uh, which I just want to uh, mention here a little bit. Um, but before we start, I mean, what are the optical forces involved? And if you look at the optical force exerted on a plasmonic particle, if you think in the Rayleigh regime, small particles, right? Just not really 100% fitting for a nanorod, but it's, it's a good way to describe it. I think you can look at a non-realistic uh, Lorentz force, which has two components, um, one a gradient and a scattering force. <clears throat> for a plasmonic particle, it means you can either trap a particle, so the gradient force will basically move the particle to the intensity gradient of the laser beam, which is a focus beam is of course the center. Or you can have the same scattering force, and if the scattering force dominates, you will have a, a force that pushes the particle along the energy flux along the pointing vector. And you can see here that um, uh, this depends uh, to some extent on the polarizability, which is complex for metallic nanoparticles. So you have a real and an imaginary part, and the real part uh, contributes to the gradient force, while the uh, imaginary part contributes to the scattering force. What that means is if we have a nanorod 20 by 120 nanometer shown here in this slide, um, you can look at the imaginary and the real part of the polarizability. So if you have a wave, laser wavelength where you radiate a particle that is at the maximum here, the polarizability of the, of the uh, imaginary part, you have strong scattering forces, the scattering forces dominate, um, which means that you will print the particle. They are stronger than the gradient force. 
if you are red shifted, you can see that the, the uh, real part is, is larger, so you can actually have a condition for optical trapping. So if you want to optically trap a laser, uh, plasmodic nanoparticle, use light that is red shifted also from the plasma resonance frequency. What is maybe interesting, if you are blue shifted a little bit here, you can see that the real part also undergoes a minimum. So you can have a condition where you have gradient forces that will pull you uh, to the center of the, of the, of the laser beam and also push it out. So if you have now a, a particle like this, 20 by 120 nanometer called nanorot, and we irradiate it here at 1064 nanometer, what we will end up with is a total force that will, as shown here in this force, may push the particle in the direction of the propagating. And then, of course, there's a second part. Now, if you irradiate a particle at its plasma resonance frequency, you introduce heating. And um, there are two papers that I want to point out here. One is the seminal work by, by Stefan Link and, and Mustafa El Sayed, where they ask the question, how does a nanorod melt? And well, what they found is that if, if you have melting of a nanorod, it kind of starts in the center of the rod by uh, point defects and, and dislocations. And then you have um, atoms that are moving from the edges and then basically uh, towards the center of the particle and you have coalescence and you end up with a, with a single sphere. And then later tailored, all they also showed in the ACS Nano paper, which I think is also very beautiful, that um, if you have longer rods, um, although you will still get uh, point effects and, and dislocations in the center, but surface diffusion becomes more important at higher aspect ratios. So longer rods, when you melt them with a laser beam uh, for the melting process, surface diffusion becomes more and more important and you can actually obtain phototermal reshaping also below the bulk melting. Um, so we are dealing obviously with longer rods here if we have an aspect ratio of about five to six, uh, roughly, which i in a little bit. So again, the general idea is we have now force and heat, and this is kind of the picture that I, that I always try to draw. I mean, it's a little bit like you're a blacksmith, and what we now try to do is with the laser beam, apply force and heat in such a controlled way that we can kind of control the outcome of the magic process. Um, so let me give you an example. We have here our uh, setup. This is the focused laser beam. These are the nanorods. Here is a high resolution TM image of these nanorods. They are in aqueous solution. We have the laser focused red light, which is exactly at the plasma resonance frequency here. Um, at top of the surface with a distance of approximately one micrometer. Now what we should expect is strong scattering forces and alignment of the particles with the uh, preferred direction of the, of the polarization of the laser beam. And indeed, this is what we find. Now, if we increase the laser power, what we find is that we cannot only print rods, but we find that we can actually, with a very high yield, obtain bent structures, which is shown here, little boomerangs, and they really kink in the, in the center of the rod. And if we do that, and we basically increase the laser power, we find actually that to some extent, we can control the bending angle very nicely. So you see that uh, this is the threshold here about 0 0.45 a gigawatt per square centimeter laser power density. When we do printing, we always obtain straight rods. If we increase uh, the laser power density, we will end up with these band structures. And if we increase it further and further, we can actually uh, get a mean of these band structures as shown here, which will uh, follow this um, this curve here. Also, we see that we can print them to some extent uh, with, a, with a certain orientation. So this is shown in this lower panel. This is the laser polarization. You can see that these band structures, they basically align with their long axis uh, along the laser polarization. However, not with the opening of the angle. And the reason why, and this is what I will explain in the next slides, is that I think we believe they, they end up with this tip here and then they fall over to the left or the right side. So the question now is also, do these particles display the optical properties you would expect from such a V-shaped antenna? We did some measurements on single particles. So this is dark field uh, Rayleigh scattering. And we see that we can uh, see a symmetric and anti-symmetric mode, the symmetric mode being the oscillation of the plasma beam, these arms of the V-shaped antenna and the anti-symmetric mode that basically goes around the curve. And we see the, the expected polarization dependence if we change the polarization of the of the uh, scatter light detection, we can see that um, in switch between the symmetric and the anti-symmetric mode. And this uh, curve here that we see follows very nicely uh, calculations that we did on, on similar structures. And what we also find is, of course, that if we have the banding angle increasing, so this is 180 degrees straight rod, 
we see that we have a, a, a slight blue shift of the longitudinal plasma resonance uh, to the to lower wavelengths. At the same time, also the intensity here of the scattering cross section is reduced. Two things that, that we found also in experiments. When we look now what happens when we bend these rods, uh, we can look here at, at the printing and bending, and we see that for a straight rod, uh, this is high uh, resolution TEM. We can see that the crystal planes are pretty much preserved here with 100 um, crystal structure. When we do the bending, we can see that in the arms, the crystal structure stays preserved. So rods don't really deform that much. But in the scale, we can see that these uh, twinning here occurs and we get um, basically what you would expect also when you look at Stefan Ling's paper that we get um, these dislocations of the crystal lattice. Now, why do they bend actually? Um, of course, we have optical force. So when we think about the optical force on a nanorod and the laser trap, um, it's not homogeneous. It's actually um, uh, distributed. And there's a theory by, by Lia et al. and Wischneck, which was uh, first introduced uh, in 2001, that you can look at the total optical force of the rod as an uh, integral of the maximal tensor and, and, this, um, and, and the surface of the rod. And what you then end, when you, when you look at the distribution of the optical force, you will find it's for the rod length that we, that we applied, it's not homogeneous. So you have a stronger force in the center and, and less strong forces at the tips. At the same time, if you print the particle, it comes from, the laser comes from the top, right? You push the particle to the liquid. So it acts against hydrodynamic pressure. Now, if you have round cap rods, then the fluid is faster around these, these tips here. And, and we uh, do Navier-Stokes. We solve the Navier-Stokes equation for this situation. We find that hydrodynamic pressure is then higher at tips and smaller in the center. So basically, Hydrodynamic pressure and the non-uniform optical load, they basically act in the same direction. That introduces a bending moment. And with this bending moment, we can bend the rods. But what that also needs is, of course, a situation where the center of the rods is softened. And here, um, this is a, a picture taken from the paper by Bafu et al, where they look at the heat about heating power densities in gold nanorods, and, and what they also reported and found is that the longer the rods, the more the heating power density is centered here. So for these very long rods, we have a higher uh, heating in the nanorod center. And we, when we do high-res TM images actually observe this. So for different bending angles, you see examples here, we find that um, these are the gold atoms. This is again, high-res TM. Um, we find that we have more um, dislocations the higher we have our laser power. Again, in the arms, the rods stay crystalline. They don't deform that much at this grade, but we have all these uh, additional effects here. But we have a orient like a, a preferred orientation of the bending. It's not random, but it goes in one direction. So then what controls the bending angle? Um, we have the optical force. We have hydrodynamic pressure. Of course, if our absorbance cross-section also blue shifts with the increasing bending angle, heating is not so efficient anymore meaning that uh, we get out of resonance with the, with the printed laser. And I try to kind of summarize this in this plot here, where you see this would be the direction of the movement of the rod. And then we have the rod moving through an area where we have the highest forces and the highest temperature. And this is of course increasing with increasing uh, uh, laser power, laser power density here. So the distance the rod travels in an area where it's still sufficiently heated and it's basically exposed to these forces is also increasing until eventually we freeze out the situation of the nano rod because um, we are so far off the resonance that we no longer really have it hot enough, so to speak, and that the bending moment is not strong enough to, to increase this deformation. Of it. So with that approach, we can control the banding angle and, and there are the two regimes that we've seen so far. One is that we print straight rods up to a certain laser power density, which is depending also on our setup a little bit because we use a 100x um, water objective and, and, and it depends on the distance here between the glass substrate and, and the focus of the laser beam. But the question is what is now happening if we increase the layer power, laser power density, right? So if we go above that, and with this experiment, and then um, we found 
first order surprise, I must say, is that we don't have band rods anymore, but we get a majority of these particle diamonds that are formed. So uh, now these are spheres, and these are SEM images. And um, when we uh, analyze uh, the average size of these spheres, we find the diameter of roughly 40.8 nanometers. So if we take two particles and we uh, use that to calculate the volume of a dimer, we see that it matches the volume of the rods that we initially used. So there's already an indication for us that we basically formed the two particles out of a single rod. Um, and we did also investigate the optical properties. So these are SEM images, and uh, we basically looked at the, uh, the uh, dark field scattering again. So this is in air, I must say. So this is why for a straight rod, the plasma resonance is shifted to about 980 nanometers. So it's, of course, more red shift than in water. So we already did these measurements in air. What you can see is we have different, basically three different particles that we find on the surface. We find straight rods, we find these dumbbell structures, which display this transversal mode and the longitudinal mode here around 900 or 800 nanometers. And we have these structures where we see a clear um, uh, dipole uh, bonding plasma mode around 600 nanometers, which is very much blue shifted here um, from, from the situation where we have these dumbbells. So in the S images, of course, we have to cover the the particles with a conductive layer, so we cannot see any gaps here. But when we did FTDD simulations, we found that for these spectrally obtained, um, the spectra that were obtained from experiments, we could reproduce the results by assuming that a rod or a dumbbell with a two particle 1.35 nanometer overlap or two particles that will be separated by about a gap of 0 0.4 nanometers. So the question is, is that real? Um, and therefore, we did. Uh, several measurements. The first, of course, what we were looking at was um, transmission scanning electron microscopy. So you can see here pictures of individual particles. The advantages of transmission scanning electron microscopy that you don't have to cover the substrate with the conductive layer because you do the measurements on TEM grids and you can try to, to look at the gaps. What we found is that we can observe gaps, but the resolution is not quite good enough uh, to look at the gap size just from this measurement alone, we also tried high resolution TM imaging. And what we found there is uh, contrary to the gold dial rods and the band structures, if we have these dimers, we can scan them even with a low energy electron beam, but very fast with a few scans. I said scan two here, it's actually more than that, but with a few scans, you can observe in the measurement that the particles get welded together by the electron beam, because we sort of also excite the structures, but the gaps are clearly visible in, in harness. TM. And um, to also confirm that, we did measurements of many particles. So this is a line of dimers printed. So this is a dark field image here. So this is under the dark field microscope. Um, and here you see one, two, three, four, five, and six. This we could not uh, get any spectra from because the particles were too close together. So we could not really uh, get a separated spectra. And we can see that we, in all cases, we get some sort of dimerization, but sometimes the structures look different, so we don't have two perfect spheres. So when we look at, at, at a situation, we have really nice and almost perfect spheres. It's about, I'd say, 50% of, of in the particles that we print. And we, in most cases, see a, a really nice um, plasma mode here which on average is, is measured over many particles at 607 nanometers. And again, if we compare that to FTDD simulations, th this would amount to a gap of 0 0.8 nanometers, which uh, fits to the, to the TM imaging, although we could not really do the high-risk TM measurements up to date because we always have this trouble of particle matching. But what it shows uh, at this point is that we have particle gaps formed in the dimer that are in the range of a nanometer or below. And what it also shows is that the particles are really separate. So they're not even connected anymore by a thread or something. So we split the particle. Now the question is, why do we split the particle? And here, if you remember in the beginning, I said for longer rod surface diffusion becomes more important. And then you look at heating of nanowires, for example, you can actually observe a phenomena, which is transformation from sphere to chain due to Rayleigh instability. So if you have gold wire that you melt will basically divide 
over such a damper structure into little proportions and have uh, particles here, right? And you can do this with light via plasmonic heating, or you can do this in bulk. And this is an example for nanowires. But for nanorods, actually, uh, theory predicts this as well. And this is uh, a paper by Nichols in Journal of Material Science in 1976, where they uh, investigated if you have a nanorod, what are the uh, aspect ratio length to diameter uh, to, if you melt it, get separated spheres, observe Rayleigh instability, or end up with a single sphere. And what they found is that if you have uh, aspect ratio up to seven, then your nanorod, a liquid beam that has the size of a nanorod, would split up into two particles if you go above that into three particles, and so on and so on. But if you are below seven, theory would predict that you end up with a single sphere, so the melting would go over a dumbbell shape and then eventually converge to a sphere, right? And uh, so this is the, the benchmark around aspect ratio of seven, where you get two spheres. And we are in this regime, we are about five, five to 5.5, right? So we're actually below that. With these nano rods, we should not see splitting. And, and we don't see splitting if we just do this on a substrate. We did a, I would say, a very easy experiment. We just had nanorods distributed in all directions on a substrate and then had a, a laser with a certain polarization and heated them individually. And of course, if you are hitting the longitudinal plasma mode, you have the highest absorbance, so you have the highest heating, so you can melt them to a sphere. But if you hit them at a different angle, heating is not as efficient. And what we basically find in this uh, surface experiment is that we can have all sorts of transitions. We see this dumbbell shape, which would actually really fit uh, to simulations that we did when we just have a, a liquid beam that converges to a sphere. But when we do the printing, right, uh, with, the, with the laser beam, so when we print it from, from solution to the substrate, we see that we have rods, we see these dye dumbbell particles, and these are other TM images, and you can see that they're still connected, but we can also see the dimers where we have these gaps formed in the TM. So we get the splitting, and then the question is why, and, and I think it's a, com or we believe it's a combination of this um, Rayleigh instability, so surface tension-driven effects, but also optical load. So this is, again, a reminder of the nanorod but the optical load is not homogeneous over the rod. You have a bending moment in the center. You would still have that also if you have two particles connected in between. So if you have this dumbbell structure, the force is not so high, but it's still highest in the center. And the same goes for the fluid hydrodynamic pressure. So you move your particle again from bottom, from the top to the bottom. So hydrodynamic pressure is, is then strong here at these little uh, balls or, or ends, end caps of this dumbbell, and, and will, if you have two particles, basically push them apart. So this combination of force and, and, and hydrodynamic pressure is what we believe uh, or helping surface tension effects to really then obtain the splitting. And another indication that splitting really happens is that we tried these uh, dimers that are printed for SAS measurements. So we functionalize them with uh, nitro thiophenol it's a simple experiment, but what we always find is that we get a clear SAS spectrum, which is another indication that we don't really have uh, some, some sort of hot wired uh, particles or that they are combined by, by uh, say, threat or something, because otherwise the E-field enhancement will break down and you wouldn't see a SAS spectrum anymore, at least not that pronounced. Okay. Uh, so here with that, I come to my summary. So what I wanted to show today is that um, by, by taking all these combinations like force, heat, but also surface tension driven effects and, and other effects that happen in fluid into uh, consideration, um, one can obtain controlled bending or splitting of gold nanorods. Um, I think this is uh, one example that by, by being in solution, um, particle shapes and, and structures could be obtained that are otherwise not easy accessible just by chemical means or, or by synthesis. And um, with that, I want to acknowledge all the contributors to that, our collaborators at the University of Antwerp, LMU Munich, and La Plata, and Columbia University, as well as uh, our chair for photonics and optoelectronics. We are situated here in this Nano Institute Munich, which is where I knew where we moved in three, four years ago. In particular, I want to thank, oh, I'm sorry, 
Ja, dann schließt die uns über most gerne das Topic Francis, Christoph, Anastasia und Paul. And I want to thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this invitation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Theo, for this interesting uh, talk on the bending and splitting of nanorobots. Um, there's already at least one or two questions of Falco in the chat. Uh, Falco, should I raise that? And there's even the hand of Michelle. So Falco was first. Uh, Falco, should I read that? I, I quickly read that. How quickly do these droplets out of nanorods form is the first question. And the second one is, have you tried to get them off the surface after printing? And if so, uh, with which yield? Um, so the first to address the first question, how quickly do they form is indeed something that we really, really want to understand. It's it's really hard to measure. We basically form them in C2. And I think um, if we would understand how we or basically optimize our experimental regard where we know exactly the entrance point of the nanorod into the laser beam, then we much better understand how the interaction takes place and, and we can much better understand how fast these processes are individually. And then maybe we can um, we can find a way to measure how, how fast that actually happens, mm -hmm. which we could not up to this point. So we, we do the experiment and um, optimize the conditions so that we can get a considerable yield, but it's still, uh, there, there's some open questions on this say. Um, regarding the second point, if you get them off the substrate, you can get them off the substrate with uh, ultrasonication, for example, but I mean, for the dimers, they would just drift apart, right? Um, for the boomerangs, um, you can get them, but the thing is that since they're printed, um, the concentration would be very low. Um, what would be interesting is if uh, one could, for example, use optical force to pick one up and um, maybe move them. So there have been reports by Michael Kell where they moved, uh, used polarized laser light to move nanorods on a substrate. And this could be a direction to, to lift them maybe and, and then uh, perform 3D manipulation of these, of these structures. Okay, thank you. Um, so there was the hand of Michelle, and I, I think yes, uh, th th thank you, uh, Frank. <laughs> yeah, thanks still for a very nice talk and nice results as always. Uh, I was intrigued by the bending of the of the nanorod. So it seems to me you know, that this force should be rather weak. So is it possible to, to calculate some sort of uh, you know uh, shear modulus, or you know uh, you know it's an elastic uh, quantity for a plastic deformation, but is it possible to estimate that? I mean, uh, to, to make the ratio of the torque that you have to the deformation that you obtain, the torque on the, yeah, the so, yes, moment. But it... So is, I mean, what is the, it seems that gold, you know, at room temperature would be way too, too stiff for that, right? Absolutely. No, at room so, temperature would be way too stiff. So the rods have to heat up. And the closest that I think gets the theory, I want to point out this paper by Liar et al. here. So they were actually, based on our first paper on the bending rods, tried to establish some theoretical framework in it. Um, because it's very complicated, because if you have a temperature increase, then you know the, the viscosity of the fluid changes. The question is uh, how soft does the rod get in the center? How yeah, exactly. you know you have to con you have to con really consider a lot of contributing factors that basically change during the reshape. Okay. So the theory, uh, and we also uh, actually, I I must uh, contact you uh, also because uh, we we really want to intensify uh, our research on that, but we are not. Uh, really suitable. We, we cannot do all these these very th different theoretical considerations. It is possible, I think this paper I would point out is the closest I know that to, to, to how to describe it, but even they admit in their paper it's very complicated because there's so but many indeed, I mean, gold becomes very, very soft, you know, like some sort of chewing gum or something. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, what you basically have to do is you have to, you have to introduce a spending moment, but then it uh, basically must be soft enough that you that you can uh, get to this to this bending process, and then, well, the laser power is important, but then the position of the laser beam is important because this determines how hot the structure is in general. So the, the from the experimental side, it's hard to to basically control the experiment in such a way that you get reproducible bent rods. And we can get that with a high yield at this point of eighty percent, but it still requires 
a lot of trial and error, I would say. And from the theoretical point, um, there are very, very factors that you that you have to consider. So this is the picture that I that I draw here is in a way sim simplified, but I think it includes the most important contributing factors. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay, okay there's two more questions. Maybe quick, uh, Yubin, uh, first. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Phil, for this great talk. So um, the splitting and the bending can be really powerful tools. So can you comment on the applicable range in terms of the diameter, the lens, or the composition, or the crystalline property of this nano wire or lot that can be applied to? Oh, so we are really now in the process of going and testing all these factors. Um, uh, te technically, I think there is a lower limit. So if you go lower with the, with the aspect ratio, right, then splitting becomes really difficult. Um, bending, we don't know exactly where the aspect ratio basically hits a value where you end up with a sphere always, because as I, as I pointed out in the beginning, um, in this paper by Tawid, uh, um, the surface diffusion is increasing for longer rods. And we're really, especially for the, for the splitting, we live from the surface diffusion effect. Um, so we also want to try different materials. Um, experimentally, I cannot give you a good idea. I can tell you that the longer the rods get, the more successful will be the, the, the separation because you have, you have this additional contribution of Rayleigh instability. Um, but we are, yeah, we are in the process of finding that out ourselves at this point, I would say. Thank you. So, Alexei, a quick question now. Yeah, a quick question. So, uh, uh, have you ever considered the uh, forms of the particles that you have? Often, by the when the people produce, like uh, by the chemical uh, way, the gold particles they are not fully uh, spheres. They often have uh, plenty of the planes. But in your case, have you ever considered this uh, the forms? of the particles that you have? Are they like... I, I, I'm not sure I completely understood the question. What do you mean by forms of the particles? Uh, so most of the time, the people, the, when uh, people producing the particles, uh, yeah. they are not completely spherical. They often have plenty of planes. Uh, 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 and uh, in your case, it was like uh, uh, uniform, it had it was uh, yeah uh, yeah I, I, uh -huh. I i think um the the reason why the particles i think what you refer to is the crystallinity here right when we look at the iris tm mm -hmm. we just um so these were synthesized by chemical synthesis and and uh, for nano rods at least this is our experience i mean these were commercial ones but typically they have a very good and very high crystallinity if you make like nanoparticles or like structured wires by EV photography, it's usually more the case that you have like uh, twitting or dislocations or crystalline, polycrystallinity, right? Mm -hmm. So these nano rods from synthesis, I mean, to be honest, we, we didn't check for different rods that maybe had more defects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the ones that, that we used, um, typically they were very highly crystalline. It doesn't doesn't mean that there may be not rods that had some defects. Mm -hmm. But then for after rods, then you come to the uh, particles. Ah, yeah, for the spherical particles, I mean, I didn't put a high-res TM image here, but if we have spheres, we really have a lot of crystal planes and stuff. So mm -hmm. basically this is, okay. Uh, so we see a lot of twinning and, and a lot of things in the crystal that is. Mm -hmm. 